Here we go again, Latin American Civilization, LEH 2020, in the summer of 2015, Summer A, for Latin American History, LEH 2020, of, at Florida International University. I'm Professor Joseph Holbrook, and we're going to go through Chapter 4 now, The Iberians' New World. And so after the Iberians, which the term Iberian uh, includes both Spanish and Portuguese from the Iberian Peninsula. After the Iberians arrived in the New World and began their conquest of the Native American civilizations, uh, they had many opportunities to gain quick wealth. And of course, this was a prime primary motivation. Uh, the appropriation of gold and silver and of the tribute systems of the Aztec and the Incas were one obvious and and a primary source of wealth. But very quickly, the uh, easy gold and silver uh, that was easily available uh, became more scarce. And so other sources, uh, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese availed themselves of other sources of wealth, such as the cultivation of commercial crops for export. Some of these included sugar cane, which they brought from the old world, sugar Cane was an old world product out of India that had become uh, available in the Ottoman Empire and the Europeans found out about it through the Crusades and began to cultivate it in some of the Atlantic islands such as the uh, Canary Islands and the Azores. Uh, they brought it with them to the New World and immediately began planting sugar cane in Hispaniola and Cuba, also in Brazil. Chocolate was a New World uh, product from the cacao bean that uh, when combined with sugar made a pretty marvelous uh, uh, invention. Also Brazil wood was uh, readily available along the coast of Brazil and was in demand in the old world. Cochineal was a red dye product made from insects, the larvae of insects on cactus plants in southern Mexico. By the end of the 18th century cochineal became the second most uh, profitable export and most in demand next to silver and also tobacco which was another Native American product that quickly caught on in the old world through pipes and cigars and became an important product for export. Precious metals were of course the dominant form of export. Gold mining began in Hispaniola in the 1490s almost as soon as the uh, Spaniards arrived Later, it became very predominant in Colombia, Ecuador, and Brazil. 180 tons were mined and shipped from 1500 A.D. through 1650. 180 tons. There was a, a silver boom during this time. In the 1540s, simultaneous silver strikes were discovered at Zacatecas in northern Mexico and also in Potosí in upper Peru, which is modern Bolivia. 16,000 tons were mined from 1500 through 1650. A lot more silver was mined and exported than gold, as you can see. So the timeline is that uh, silver was found in the 1540s. In the 1560s, uh, diseases and epidemics devastated the Indian population in Brazil. Uh, most of the Indian populations dropped by 90% in the 100 years after the arrival of Europeans. Uh, in the 1570s, Viceroy Toledo uh, arrived in Peru in order, attempting to bring some kind of order out of that complete uh, confusion that was per Peru. In 1580, Brazil became the world's leading producer of sugar. Uh, especially in Bahia, Pernambuco. In 1628, the uh, the uh, Dutch pirate Piet Hain seized the me entire Mexican silver fleet off of Matanzas Bay in Cuba, which uh, included 12 million guilders, or 34 tons of silver. And Spanish cannon ports in the Spanish fleet were blocked by all the silver. This was an, a major coup by a Dutch pirate. Uh, when we, we had to keep in mind when we say pirates, they, they were pirates from the Spanish point of view, but from the Dutch and, or English point of view, they were often privateers who were working on behalf of their governments. 
Uh, they were often also Protestants who objected to Spanish and Portuguese Catholicism out of a matter of principle and consider it, considered it service to God to attack the Spanish or Portuguese. So both religion and politics come into this issue of piracy in the 1620s. In 1650s, the Brazilian sugar industry began to decline, and by the 1690s, the first gold discoveries were being made in the interior of Brazil. Silver mining was an important, uh, obviously the most important uh, industry in the Americas for export. It required considerable input of capital and intensive labor. Workers put in long hours under extremely hazardous conditions. Production began to decline in the 17th century as readily accessible ores were exhausted and mine owners were faced with shortages of labor. Also, as the mines went deeper into the ground, they found themselves being they found them being flooded, and they had to develop more advanced and sophisticated forms of engineering to pump out the water out of the mines. A major challenge was the lack of labor supply for mining. In terms of mining, Africans were too expensive. Uh, native slaves were not very reliable. Uh, one solution was the repartimiento which uh, forced natives to donate a certain amount of their uh, rotating, uh, rotating, rotating shifts of po uh, populations that donated a certain portion of their year to mining. This was uh, called the Mita in Peru and was first organized by Viceroy Toledo in 1570. One-seventh of the adult male population had to give a full year. So every seven years, the entire population would serve in the, uh, in the mines at least theoretically. They were paid, but it was not a living wage. So many young men fled from their uh, tribes and clans, Ayayulus, as they were called in Peru, to avoid the Mita. Wealthy natives could buy their way out of it. And here's a picture of a, uh, a silver mine and refining practice in uh, the Andes in Peru. Gold mining became predominant in Brazil. In the 1690s, Bandeirantes struck gold in the parsley populated region that soon became, became known as Minas Gerais. Uh, in English, that would be General Mines. Uh, Bandeirantes were, is the name that was applied to the uh, pioneers and the uh, frontiersmen that came out of Sao Paulo in Brazil. They tended to travel in, uh, in caravans with a flag. And the flag was the bandera, so they became known as the banderenches. They were sort of like the uh, the cowboys of the Wild West in the uh, in the United States mythology, but uh, they were the Brazilian equivalent. They also tended to be mercenaries and slavers, and and sought for uh, Native Americans to enslave as forms of labor. And uh, those were the banderenches. If you watch the movie The Mission, although Mendoza Rodrigo Mendoza was uh, a Paraguayan in the film. He fit the profile of the typical Paulista Bandarunchi. There was a gold rush that ensued. Paulistas and northeastern Brazilians uh, quickly moved into the Minas Gerais area in search of gold. And there were also many uh, recent arrivals from Portugal that were seeking their fortunes. From 1700 to 1799, 170,000 kilograms of gold were mined out of Minas Gerais. Also in the 720s, they discovered diamonds, and diamond mining became popular. Most of the gold was found in stream beds. Workers suffered from malaria, dysentery, and there was also the growth of an African slave labor force. Proximity to Africa between, of course, eastern Brazil and western Africa is not a great distance, as you, one might think, across the Atlantic. So proximity to Africa and the well-established precedent of the Portuguese slave trade made slaves cheaper in Brazil than that was they were for the Spanish in places like Cuba. There was a decline in the sugar trade after 1650, which encouraged people to leave uh, Bahia and Pernambuco and go to Minas Gerais in search of other forms of, uh, of income. In Minas Gerais, there were 30,000 slaves in 1775, but... Uh, in just a few years, that grew quickly to 150,000. And here is a slave, I'm sorry, a, a sugar production 
uh, sugar and ginio. Uh, in terms of agriculture, the uh, primary source of agriculture was haciendas and ranchos in uh, Mexico primarily. So haciendas were large landed estates that uh, grew a number of different crops and usually uh, had a large number of cattle. Encomenderos and others began producing wheat and crops such as barley, alfalfa, and vegetables on small plots of land, often receiving forced allocations of Indian labor for the harvest season. The sale of cattle, horses, oxen, mules, pigs, goats, and sheep was uh, common, and sheep ranching was also uh, common. They were incentives to attract resident workers. The estate formation in Mesoamerica was gradual. A typical hacienda in the early 17th century consisted of a, patch, of a patchwork of properties. Land accumulation in Brazil was straightforward. Religious orders also accumulated large amounts of land holdings. Franciscans, Dominicans, and Jesuits brought, bought up small, small parcels of Indian land. The Jesuits developed an exceptionally extensive network of rural properties to support their frontier missions and churches and schools in major cities. The Jesuit estates were occasionally worked by African slaves. They uh, also had wine and sugar production in coastal Peru. In Brazil, the Jesuits owned several of the largest sugar plantations. In the 17th century, incomoderos who had been invested in commercial agriculture, mining, or trade were counted among the elite of Spanish America. Marriage alliances allowed them to marry into higher nobility. There were shifting market conditions. Buyers wanted the traditional prestige of land ownership, which was a prestige system going back into old Europe, of course, with the landed nobility. Let me back up. I think I missed one here. So... This is a map of uh, New Spain. You see that many of the cities were kind of clustered around uh, the former Tenochtitlan of the Aztec Empire, which was converted into Mexico City. And here you see the same thing in South America. You see a large number of uh, villages and cities clustered around the uh, Inca Empire. The uh, old capital of the Inca Empire, also the northern cap, the extreme northern capital of the Inca Empire was was Quito, Ecuador, and you see several cities there, and in Bogota, and then on the coast, northern coast of South America, and then in Brazil, many of the early cities were uh, were developed around the sugar production in Pernambuco and Bahia, but then you also have San Paulo and Rio de Janeiro on the coast, uh, further south in Brazil, and then. The interior, interior began to get explored and developed as uh, gold was discovered in Minas Gerais. Trade and transportation uh, was very important, of course, in order to transport all the silver. The movement and exchange of all these commodities provide many avenues to fortunes for merchants and accountants, shippers and haulers of freight. The British, French, and Dutch pirates preyed upon international shipping, forcing Spain and Portugal to spend considerable sums on defending their cargoes and crews. Gold and silver were the most valuable commodities, which was an attractive target for plunder by the English, D Dutch, and French. Two fleets set out from Seville annually, one for Veracruz, and the Veracruz, Mexico, and the other for Cartagena, Colombia, and the Isthmus of Panama. These, their cargoes included Spanish wine, olive oil, salted cod, and other foodstuffs being exported or uh, from Spain and imported into the Americas. Uh, clothing, tools, textiles, satins, brocades, lace, linen, often of northern European manufacture. Overland transport included ox-drawn wagons and carts, occasionally mule, mule trains, and even in Peru occasionally on the backs of llamas. And here you see a llama train. And uh, merchant uh, merchants and trade began to flourish as uh, the economy developed. You had cities that were growing rapidly. Uh, Mexico City was the largest city in the Western Hemisphere with 100,000 people in the 17th century. And also Lima, Peru grew quickly. And that's all we have time for today. So 
I will encourage you to read the chapter, and we'll continue next.